Well, good day. This is Sandy Moss here again with some things out of my closet. Uh, today I brought in a, a uh, odd looking cone shaped affair here. Uh, it's made, I think, of willow twigs or stems from willow branches or stems that have, have been curved probably by steaming or or putting them in hot water and letting the wood soften and then bending them in sort of arc-like circles or shapes, probably around a form of some kind. And then uh, these things have been bound together by tying the junctures between the different willow sticks with tendon or what we think of as sinew, probably from a deer caribou, or it could be even from uh, a marine mammal like walrus or whale. Don't really know what kind of sinew it is. And then <clears throat> that the whole thing forms a cone-shaped affair, and then it's been wrapped around with strands of skin. This is either deer skin or caribou skin, with the fur on it and the undersides of just rawhide on untanned. And so you get this, this sort of closure, this disruption of the visual field through the sides of this, this affair. Uh, do you think we could get a real close-up of the sinew here? You can see up in here, and you can, if you look closely, you can see there's, these are sort of thick uh, pieces of tendon, which is very elastic and kind of sticky too in its fresh state uh, and this comes from the hind legs probably of a deer uh, and the tendon is the material that attaches the muscle fibers ultimately getting into smaller and smaller fiber or larger and larger fibers as the individual tendon pieces coalesce and finally inserting on a piece a part of the bone you know the, the good example in, in us is our Achilles tendon that runs from the calf muscles down to the heel. Now, sinew is, is typically a, a binding that's used most frequently by various Native American tribes. It's sort of the, the thread, the, the cord, the twine of uh, a lot of Native groups of people. And the fact that this is deer or caribou hide, uh, the wood is willow, uh, leads me to believe that this is probably from uh, the far north or perhaps even the Arctic, but I I kind of favor being in the sort of the, the southwestern part of Alaska, perhaps around where the Yukon River uh, dumps into the Bering Sea, uh, and that's the place where you'll find these willows growing in some abundance. The, the hide here could be from caribou, which are really not native to that place. More likely, uh, it would be some sort of deer, perhaps black-tailed deer or white-tailed deer or possibly even elk or caribou from, from that area. And so what we have here is this cone-shaped thing, which doesn't have any wrapping around the top here of this, of this uh, hide-bearing fur, and the bottom is open. So if you look in here, there's just a, a surrounding uh, wrap of a larger, slightly larger willow stem. My own belief, I don't know this for sure, but my own belief is that this is part of a fish trap, possibly a model fish trap. Uh, and the idea is that this perhaps could have had another piece made out of willow that projected inside here, sort of a, a cone-shaped uh, piece of willow with sort of jagged ends that allowed a fish to swim into this and get beyond that cone and then not be able to swim out very easily. Uh, and this kind of trap is, is, has been used by uh, native uh, Eskimos in the southern part of their range along the, uh, the, uh, um, at the mouth of the Yukon River, or perhaps uh, various Native Americans to the south of there uh, getting into the uh, northwest coast Indian tribes the most northern of which would be the Thlingit Indians. Uh, and this would have worked by using it in a weird sort of 
situation where you take a stream in which fish are migrating upstream, say salmon, for example, and, uh, and by taking rocks in the stream that they're ascending and building sort of a partial dam, you can leave gaps in that among the rocks and produce a channel which the fish have to come through. So the water is rushing through this channel and you put a trap such as this in that channel fish swim into it, swimming up into the current. And if you've got a barrier to prevent them getting out, uh, they'll accumulate there. Or you can just visit these and just tip them up to trap the fish that happen to be in there at the time. Now I think this is probably a model. I think it was, it was probably made for catching salmon or perhaps arctic char that were migrating upstream for spawning. And this is a smaller version of what the larger full-size one would be. And the full-size one might be uh, perhaps six to ten feet long and having several segments in it. Or it could be just for, for smaller fish too. So it's kind of, a, of an unusual thing. It's very well made. It's, it's kind of unique in my experience of, of knowing exactly what it is, but it's, it's clearly a trap for fish. Now these same people in this area that I'm talking about, at the mouth of the Yukon River and Kuskokwim Rivers, which are uh, draining the, the Canadian side of the Bering Strait into, into uh, Alaskan waters, those people uh, also fish for very, very small fish that are called blackfish. They're maybe three inches long, two inches long. Uh, and they're kind of interesting. They're related to the killifish or mummy chogs that, that we have in the eastern United States. Uh, and they're very small, very dark colored, and they have this very interesting property of being able to survive very cold temperatures. Uh, and they can actually be frozen into the ice and not freeze themselves. Uh, so these blackfish, which are caught by the thousands in some of the Yupik uh, Eskimo groups in, in southern Alaska and form a very important part of their, their wintertime diet, these little fish uh, have this ability to survive in very, very cold water. And that is due physiologically because they accumulate lots of glucose, that is sugar, in their blood. And they reduce the freezing point of their blood below that of the surrounding water. So they can be frozen in, in ice, and still not have their tissues freeze completely. And it's sort of interesting that that's when these, uh, when these southern native Alaskan Eskimo people catch them in great numbers and they relish them because they're sweet. You know, they, they have very, very uh, uh, sweet tasting flesh due to the accumulated sugar that they, they withstand. It might, might turn people off to know something that happens in insects as well. Insects which form larvae and pupate and can survive the winter in frozen conditions. I wonder how a butterfly or a moth can come out and start flying around on a cold day. It's because they also accumulate Sugar is a different sugar from glucose, but their bodies are filled with this stuff. And I've been told, I never have done this, but I've been told that you can take these pupae of a large insect and put it between your teeth and bite down on it and you get a very, very sweet taste from it. Some people like to do that. So, there's a fish trap.